So we have three speakers. Each speaker will talk for about 10 minutes. Um, Dr. Petrus Gunarsson from uh, sustainability, the sustainability, sustainability Director from April will talk about the, 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 the fire and haze that April is wrapping in every year. Then we've got Ahmad Diawulak from um, the People and Forest Centre who will talk about how mediation can be used to uh, solve conflicts between communities and private sector. And myself, I will, I will give the first presentation. I'll be talking about the causes and impacts of the fires of last year in 2013. Okay, well, until 2013, transplant and haze events in Southeast Asia were exclusively associated with El Nino conditions, with large forest fires that followed the extended El Nino droughts. But in June 2013 of last year, and more recently in February 2014, both non El Nino years, We've seen indeed that Indonesian fires generated extreme pollution levels over Sumatra, Malaysia, and Singapore. Now look at this graph. This is the PSI data, Singapore's Pollutant Standard Index, daily. It's a measure of the five pollutants, concentration of the five pollutants into the atmosphere. The data started to be recorded in January 1937 and you can see in this graph that on 22 June 2013 the PSI reached a record high of 246 which was nearly double the one that was reached on 19 September 97 at the peak of the El Nino of 97-98 and also higher than the El Nino of 2006. Now, during an El Nino year, fires in Indonesia are pretty much everywhere. Primarily concentrated in like the southern part of Sumatra, the southern part of Borneo Island, some of the islands there, but also in southern Papua. This is the situation of fire intensity as of October 2006. The red areas being the areas being the most intense. But in June 2013, we've seen that the fires were actually only concentrated in the central part of Sumatra, pretty much the whole of Riau uh, province. We're actually seeing very big differences large fires during El Nino years. Last year, only an area in Sumatra was affected, but it created extreme pollution levels over its um, over neighboring countries. In fact, when we looked more closely, the bulk, the majority of those fires were coming from this small area in the northern part of Riau, which is about 1.6% of Indonesia's landmass. And what we did is we took Landsat images and we estimated that about 160,000 hectares had burned within a week between the 17th and 24th of June 2013. And 84% of that burning, or 100, about 137,000 hectares, was on big land. Now, this image to the left, I've put in because a lot of people use fire hotspots. And what we found is very good spatial correspondence between our maps and the fire hotspots. So we can safely say that the fire hotspot data are actually good data to look at where the hotspots, where the fires are happening. Then what we did is we've actually measured what, what is it that has burnt. Forest, everybody talks about forest fires. Well, we're actually seeing that only 7% of the area that had burned qualified as forest before the burning. But 82% of the area that burned, about 130,000 hectares, 
was actually not forest. Now this is a very, very different scenario from, from the 97 scenario where we had about 4.5 to 6 million hectares of forest that had burned. Now, the non-forest, now it's a bit of a vague term, what is it? So what we did is that the month after the fire, we went to the field with uh, uh, like a model airplane or a, a UAV or a drone, and we flew this model airplane at several different locations along transects. This transect here represents location number five, and what we could do is that we could we find our mapping, we create detailed maps of vegetation proper before fire, as well as validate our Landsat based burned area map with the UAB based burned area. Now, just look here, we've also identified excavators one month after fire preparing land for burning. And what this analysis tells us is that of this 82% this non-forest area that's burned, we find that 57%, over half of that, was actually what we've termed forest cemeteries. In other words, mosaics of scrubs and exposed soils with stumps and down trunks and branches. You're there, you can see, this is no longer forest, but you know just by looking that it was forest long ago. Then we've also found some can... young oil palms, some plantations, and a bit of acacia that's burned as well. It could mean conflict, it could mean escape fires. But what's important to remember is that the bulk of the burning did not occur in forests, but it occurred in areas that were already deforested. Now these lands, if you walk there at noon during the day, they're extremely hot, they're extremely flammable, flammable particularly if we're talking of peat soils. Now, this is one of the reasons it burns, because it's easy to flammable. Uh, this is a photo of the month after the fire. You see all the stumps and down trunks and trunks. People set fire essentially to clean the land, prepare the land for, for burning. And what we've done is we've looked at the pre fire deforestation area, totally devastated over the last 20 years. So, what does that mean? that the 2013 Sumatran fires were not forest fires. In other words, they caused negligible direct deforestation. However, they are part of the process that converts forest to plantations. Now, I've drawn a, a, like a, a little schematic diagram here. So imagine this is, this is a time forest is being burned gets quickly converted to agriculture. But actually, there could be a good number of years before the forest becomes converted to agriculture. And it stays in the degraded land for a good number of years before. So you can have many, many fires for various different reasons. Now, is there a climatic influence? We said that it was a non El Nino year, so supposedly not a, clim not a climatic influence. 2013 was actually wetter than the average. However, that's the graph that shows that. However, we found rainfall deficits two months before the fire. The fire happened at the end of June. We found that in May and June 2013, rainfall was below average. And when we looked at 12 years of data, we found this correlation between rainfall averaged over two months before fire and firepower uh, uh, during that month. So, yes, there is some sort of climatic influence in the sense that if it's too wet, it's not going to burn. But what's happened last year is that all it took was a short-term dry period, about two months, for, for, for fires to start. Then we measured the carbon emissions and we found, uh, we estimate that those fires released about 171 teragrams of uh, CO2 equivalents into the atmosphere in one single week. This represents 5 to 10 percent of Indonesia's total emissions. That's enormous because it originates from 1.6 percent of Indonesia's land mass and only one week. So, to summarize the Indonesian fires, this is kind of a takeaway message here. 
they were triggered by a two month dry spell in an otherwise rainy year. Now this, you know, this means trouble because it means that fires can actually strike every year. All it takes is just a month or two of droughts, not even drought, we're not talking about like extreme droughts here, we're talking of dry spells. These fires were short-lived, only one week, confined to recently deforested peatlands in a localized area, etc. However, the emissions were huge because of the peat. 90% of the carbon emissions came from the peat, and the fires generated unprecedented atmospheric pollution over its neighbors because of the proximity and the prevailing winds at the time. So quickly, who burnt? We don't really know, but we think that both companies and small owners are doing it. We've looked at, we've looked at concession data, we've overlaid the burning, and we found that 52% of the burning was in the concessions, but when we looked more closely, in more into detail in the concession data, we found that a lot of the concessions in black areas here were actually already occupied by, by communities. And of the 52% that burned in the concessions, the bulk of it burned in those black areas where we think that there's actually overlapping claims um, over land ownership between communities and between, um, between private sector. So I will now hand over to Paket Rus, who will uh, 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 enlighten us more about this problem. Thank you very much, David. Uh, what David just mentioned to us is focusing more on the unmanaged area, unmanaged land. Now we move to the, the area where it is managed, and you can see when, when it is managed, the fire exists or not, just depending on how you manage the land itself. <laughs> Particularly the peatland, the important part of managing uh, the peatland area is managing the water level. So that is one of the, the most important part. Uh, uh, David mentioned about 82% on non-forest area. So you can imagine that if it is a non-forest area, then who owns that area? That is the big question. Later on I will discuss on how the non-forest area is, is managed so far. Okay, so this is the outline of my uh, presentation. Uh, I was asked, I'm not sharing the, the presentation with David yet, but actually uh, David confirmed why the uh, fire in that area is actually uh, can we look at the, the exact location and why there is some, some conflict? That's why in my presentation I call it fire and conflict because David asked me to, to look at is there any relation with the conflict in that area. So my presentation will be focused in a, in a area, uh, area, but particularly in our own concession. And then David also asked me whether that conflict exists. Yes. There are, but how that conflict is managed. And we also describe on uh, how, how the conflict is uh, mediated. Later on, Ahmad, the next speaker, will talk about that more. Uh, if you look at the uh, fire in, in the area, actually, uh, multifaceted causes. It's not only one cause that made fire in the area. There are multifaceted, from economic reasons, from governance issues, from biophysical, and also from social and population, uh, and population issues. If you look at negative tone, if you look at the negative tone of it, for example, for economic, people always say that uh, that is because of land hunger, or timber hunger, or deforestation. But if you look at from the the uh, positive perspective, there is because of increased land, uh, increased land demand, rapid development, and also more reforestation in the area where it can produce timber. On the issue of governance, you can also see or listen from the publication or from uh, news, negative tone of it, because 
if you look at the governance, because uncertainty of land use, David mentioned on the area where 82%, how that 82% area is actually managed, right? So if you look at also from a, a positive tone, that is because lack of resources even for simple map in the area. Uh, in the plenary, we listen about the emphasis of having one map, for example. Because the map, up to now, the spatial planning in the region is not yet finalized. It's already two years delay. So, with that condition, then, then what's happening on the ground is really uncertain who owns and who manages the land. That is the important part. Why the fire is exists. From social uh, aspect, if you look at the negative tone, there is illegal practice, there is uh, people are getting land illegally, and so on and so forth. But if you look at uh, from the positive tone, maybe we can see that on the ground, there are self-governance. Because of no clear governance on the land use, then there are self-governance. They are looking for their own land by using their own uh, way. No? Or we can also look at the positive aspect that because people are looking for jobs, people want to work, people want to get land for them, then that is a the positive story. Uh, but if you look at the, the company where I'm now working, uh, I'm working now for Apple. Uh, Apple is uh, integrated from plantation, pulp, and paper production. The company has been implementing what we call it no burden policy since the inception of the company. So we we never have intention of burning the fire. But people will always say that why is your concession there is fire? Of course then I will explain later on, on why it is exists some fire in our area because we are not in a very isolated. We are neighboring with many other <laughs> land uses and then activities, land use activities. So uh, if you ask me why you implement no burning policy, yes, because the, the wood or the fiber is our raw material. So no way for us to burn it, right? Instead of burning, you can use it, right? So that is the, the, the policy that we implement. And if you look at the recent news, when we have fire, we are fighting more outside of the area than within the area. So basically, we provide Outside call of duty for, for most of us. Plus, uh, the new ones we mobilize more than 600 firefighters. <laughs> Not only our own, but also community trained firefighters. To fight fire mostly outside the our <laughs> But of course, we have to protect our own. But most of the fire is in the outside the area. Okay. Uh, one issue that we want to, to, to elaborate here is actually about the conflicting rule. Why I call it conflicting rule? Because up to now, the community is allowed to burn for two hectares of their land. But you can imagine if 2,000 people are having each two hectares, it may be also big. So their law is, is being a little bit difficult. How to avoid that? For example, based on and jumping because of the white wind and because of the, uh, uh, the big fire itself is jumping to our area. That is the reason why it's quite often happening on the ground. So, uh, another also local wisdom is, is looks good, looks nice, but which wisdom? Are they still implementing it? That is the problem, because many people now, 
is supposed to plan only for local variety or species, but in reality they are going for like the palm oil, for example, or something that's that not protected like this one. They are surrounded by proper fire break. Do they do that? That is the big question. So if they have two different regulations that conflict them, then it will be very difficult for police or law enforcement to enforce it. Uh, this is just an example. In the area, for example, this is our, our plantation. And then the neighboring area is burning. We often obtain this, uh, this area. This area, but they are angry at us. Why you contain the fire? We need to clear land. So that sometimes happens like that. So how, how can you do that? Okay? So this is one example. They burn this at the side, and then there are so many fire here while our area is very close to nearby. How to, to, to deal with that? And in the area, even in this very clear here, you have even your, your uh, Felix uh, office, but around it by unmanaged area and burning. Yeah, one minute. <laughs> okay, and then this is another example. Just around the, the village there, it can happen like that. And this is not managed. Yeah, this is one example. So, uh, our solution then, <coughs> This is the, the solution that we suggested or we provided that we need uh, in the short term firefighting, of course, but we need to work on a longer period, a longer period of preventing the fire is more important. Uh, we work with the community, we work with the Badan Red uh, and also other institutions to work for the short term period, but we need to work in a longer period, uh, in the longer term period. I mean. So, for example, legality and licenses, and then engage with national and international institutions, which is working with others. And we also understand the real situation. Right now, we have some proposal from from CIMO, for example, uh, the central uh, and the city that to work with us. Try to, to, to find out what is the actual situation. And uh, our recommendation to the national government, because the time is very limited, you can tell me not to find it, but it's seven now. So I just finalized the recommendation there. The national government has to finalize the spatial plan, which is already two years delayed now. So they have to finalize that as soon as possible to make clear who owns the land and who has to manage the area. And then the, the local governments should allocate funding for fire prevention, <coughs> prevention rather than waiting for the national to come when the fire is already big. And then also the villagers to implement reward and punishment, for example, and then to company to provide capacity building and support for no burning uh, farming practice. I skip this one. This one, the last slide that I want to show you, that we are spending a lot of money to really maintain the water level, to protect the, the, the plantation from fire. We call it hydro, eco hydro. So that's all because time is up. So thank you very much for your attention. And our next speaker, Ahmad Yala. Fire and conflict. My name is Ahmad. Uh, I'm from Recovery Center for People and Forest. Today I'll talk about conflict and fires in Riau. Although we know that from earlier discussion that fire is indeed a transboundary issue, but uh, today I'll just talk about specific in Riau province. 
Uh, why? Because uh, this is where the 2013 and 2014 fire were uh, mostly happening. And also because there are a lot of conflict over nature resources happening in this province. Uh, I'll talk about three things uh, in this presentation. First is I'll talk about uh, the general overview of community outsider conflict, which uh, many of them are happening in uh, plantation areas. And also then I'll continue to talk about how fires interact with conflict and, and the other way around. And uh, after that I'll talk about how mediation can be a tool for transforming this conflict which is uh, most, uh, uh, I'll talk about the, re the result of some of our study on aviation in Southeast Asia. So, Rikov, uh, where I work, is just uh, before I continue my presentation. Rikov uh, is a capacity building organization. We are uh, focusing on how to strengthen the rights of local people, improve governance and fair benefits for, for local people in managing forests. We have 26 uh, years experience in developing capacity of uh, not just local people, also private, also and also government. Okay, let's, uh, let's start the <coughs> the first uh, section of my presentation. Conflict over forest and land is a key and recurring issues in in Riau. Is uh, if you read the. Uh, national or local newspaper, you can see clearly that this conflict often uh, covered in the media. And many of them are conflict between local communities and external actors, such as mining companies or plantation oil palm companies, and investors or even migrants in the area. And it's a uh, the trend is like it's increasing nowadays, not just because there are increasing demand for land, but also because of weak governance, unclear tenure, and also development that economic development and still prioritize national and international interests over the interests of local communities. So this is uh, the picture of the figure of natural resource conflict in Riau. As you can see here, natural resource conflict in Riau is still dominated by conflict within plantation. It's happening a lot in in area where timber plantation and palm and plantation, and few of them are in mining and conservation areas. As you can see here, in 2011, in timber plantation, there are about two, more than 250,000 hectares are still and in conflict, and where in total there are about 3,000 hectares are still in dispute with local communities. And why this is happening? I think there are many of these conflicts happening because of the, the government policies in the past in granting the concession to the companies. Sometimes when the government uh, grants the concession in many areas in Piao, there is not an empty land. There are people living there for generations, for centuries. And I'll show you later. And this map is uh, the map of Distribution of indigenous communities in Riau. There are Bonai communities, Sakai, Petalangan, there are Talamama communities living there for centuries. So when the government issue a, a concession in that area, without considering their people there, sometimes there, are, there will be causing conflict. So how serious is the issue? In 2011, there are about 30 cases only in Riau, and four people died. In 2012, 37 people injured. And 2013, also another many people are died every year. 
So this is really a serious issue uh, in Riau. Many, every year, there are people killed, there are people who have to move to other places from their village uh, because of this one. So how fire and conflict relates? In many studies, uh, earlier studies, Sometimes fire is used to express dissatisfaction of the of the injustice that the local community sometimes felt in the protest or something. Sometimes it involves burning. Fire can also use as a tool for claiming land and exclude others. There are studies in the past that. There are many uh, uh, fire incidents that some people think that it is made to 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 make uh, anxiety and fear to exclude people. And also indirectly, the incidents of conflict or can undermine incentive for law all the stakeholders in on the ground to involve in the fire management. It's likely that when they are in conflict, it's likely that they are less motivation, they have less willingness to also to put out the fire, to to fight the fire. And also conflict of ownership over the land causing unclear responsibility. So I think it's uh, has been presented in earlier uh, presentation that because of this unclear ownership, it's hard, it's difficult to pinpoint who is responsible for that fire. So how to deal with these issues of conflict in the area? Rikov, since 2012, has been doing uh, research to see how mediation can be used as a tool for transforming this conflict. Why uh, we choose mediation as a topic? Because earlier, our earlier study says that in many cases of forest conflict that, that can be resolved are involved third party who help uh, mediate the conflict. Sometimes, sometimes uh, mediation alone between two parties, it doesn't work because of a long, uh, prolonged conflict. They don't trust each other. So sometimes third party's help is needed. So what is uh, mediation? Yeah, mediation here is a process whereby an acceptable third party assists conflicting parties in resolving conflict, but without uh, having authority to make decisions. So the decision is still with the conflict parties, not the mediator itself. So this is just a story of uh, one of our case study in Lobuk Chiring village. According to local communities, they claim that they have been there since the Dutch colonial era, before 1940s. And, uh, here is uh, the graphic showing the severity and duration of conflict. So here, yes, since 2007, there is a concession granted in that area, and uh, the conflict started. Uh, ebb and flow in that area. And the, the big point is when the, there is a land clearing, land clearing of the, uh, by the com plantation company to prepare for the plantation. And there are uh, land owned by local communities also cleared. So there was a rejection and yeah, pressure from local community as well, and they do blockade, and there are some fire incidents happening. But still, it's, it's difficult when we ask different, like we, if we ask company, company will say it's local community, and lo local community say it's company made the fire. Oh, sorry. But one of the important points is that there is a mediation uh, there, uh, which um, the mediator can invite uh, the local communities and also the companies together to discuss how to resolve this uh, of planning plans. And then uh, the graphic of intensity of the conflict is reduced 
after the series of mediation. Yeah, mediation have some roles. Uh, mediation provide a platform for multi-stakeholder dialogue, and also they can also build trust between local, uh, between the conflicting parties, and also create conducive environment for problem-solving processes. And it's uh, so some outcome of that mediation in local jury. Achievement of the agreement significant reduction of tension and intensity of conflict. Relationship between company and community is greatly improved. And smoother, of, smoother operation for company means higher profits. And we have to uh, ask if it's sure. And additional income for communities. Because of their compensation and everything and partnership between company and local community. There are challenges, maybe I don't have much time to explain this, but a uh, take-home message from this presentation, there are three take-home messages. First is, firefighting alone is not, will, will not be enough to, uh, to address fire issues in Sumatra without addressing land tenure conflict. And also, there is a need of recognizing long-standing land claims and rights of local communities because they have been there for centuries and they have been managing their land for a long time. And also, how to promote mediation as the tool, one of the alternative tools for transforming conflict and building a long-term collaboration between the conflict parties. Thank you. Okay, well, now it's time for questions. Um, Okay, um, you want to go first? Because you ask first. Okay? Okay, go ahead. What's your question? My question was to the presenter from April. My name is Susanna Kroger from Greenpeace. And I had a question about why there was no emphasis on the need for full peatland protection and peatland restoration in your presentation because that would be. That would be the obvious thing a large plantation company should be doing to prevent forest fires. It's monopoly. The bottom line is the bottom line on managing peatland is how to maintain the water level. So actually, if I have time, and today I want to, to explain on how we, as a, as a company, manage the water level by using from uh, simple into very sophisticated uh, uh, water, we call it water gate or water coach, you know. So we use that kind of thing. So that is the, the way we, we manage the people. Is that answer the question? Yes? It doesn't answer the question of why plantation companies don't commit to full people protection as the key mitigating action against uh, forest fires. Okay. Uh, Indonesia has large area of peat. And then the government has given us area to manage. So we implement technology to manage peatland. So if all the peatland in Indonesia basically stop, then how about the economic value of 22 million hectares of peatland in Indonesia. Just for example, the whole Riau province, 50% of the Riau province is peatland island. So that, that, that situation has to be, uh, to be understood. The whole Netherlands is peatland, for example. That's also uh, because you use technology, you can manage. The only problem is how you manage, how you manage that particular area using Knowledge and technology. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So I'm quite pessimistic actually dealing with the big fire because it is not only a matter of conflicting with the social, conflicting with the other communities, but it is because of the nature of the pit itself. Why I'm saying this? Because we don't know exactly the subsurface topography underneath. So this is one of the major reasons why it is very difficult to put out the fire from the pit, pit area. So 
in reality, you know what happened? In almost many parts of Vietnam in Indonesia, is almost drained. So the main causes of fire because the water in the pit is already getting down and the pit materials becoming drier and drier. Yeah. So back again to Riau. Riau is the largest pitland area in the world, tropical country. It's in Riau. So if you look at what, what happened in Riau, the Acacia planting, the oil palm planting. So all of these are not native species. So they have to drain the water table and then they clear dry materials. Yeah. So you cannot put out the fire until you really inundated the whole area. So this is the difficulties because we don't know where the fire actually hiding somewhere underneath. Yeah. So again, I'm quite pessimistic dealing with this and I was asked by a hotel in Riau. He was complaining, our hotel now getting problems because less gas coming in and I told them, sorry, this is quite difficult. Fire will be happening every year in Riau. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, appreciate all the presenters. Um, the last one by Aman, I just have a question for you about the agreement uh, in the graphic that you showed um, after the, the, you know, the uptick with the conflict, there was mediation and that, you know, graph lands to different at the present time. Do you have any confidence that after the mediation, there's not going to be another escalation because previously there were upticks in conflict after it seemed that there was some agreement between the concession holder and, and the, the local communities. But then there must have been some breach or um, maybe not all of the, the key stakeholders were included in the agreement. So in this last agreement that you talked about, um, are all of the key stakeholders included? Hello, I'm Faisal Parrish from uh, the SNP Forest Project. Uh, just a question to uh, David Gabo. Uh, you mentioned about the, the 2013 fires. Have you done any comparison with the situation in 2014 yet, or is that in, in the pipeline? And then for Petrus Donato, I think, I mean, what, what you mentioned uh, is part of the solution that the companies need to mobilize and you, I think in your last one you four four actions for for different partners local government companies uh, national agencies and, uh, and local people what practical steps can or what is needed to put those measures in place really to prevent fire in, in a province like Rio where it's getting worse and worse uh, each year Thank you. Um, we, we're, we're, we're working on the 2014 analysis. Um, uh, the, they were also occurring in Rio. They occurred in February, March, different kind of year, but they were also um, sort of a short dry spell before that. So um, it looks like we're more or less in the same conditions as last year. But we, we are actually working on the details and the numbers. In answering uh, what need to to make that recommendation happen, one, of course, we need to, to collaborate more open among those uh, players or among stakeholders in the area. Because right now, each of them are working on their own. Even we are recently, we have a lot of uh, effort. It's actually spending a lot of resources Last two months, we could and could donate two helicopters for fighting the fire, for example. That is actually beyond our call of duty, beyond our area. But because we are responsible, we have the government to do that. That is part of the uh, initial stage of the collaboration. We need to do that more. Thank you. Thank you for that, your question. Yes, it's true that uh, all conflict management tools, there is no, there is no silver bullet. We just need to choose which one is better than other. So of course, mediation has uh, many uh, weaknesses as well and challenges when we implement in the field. So for example, the question is whether is there a possibility that uh, conflict can escalate again in the future. I think 
possibility yes there is because mediation alone cannot really uh, address the un the unclear tenor itself it needs the policy changes as well so sometimes uh, mediation cannot address it at the policy at national level that's one of the challenges in the field uh, also uh, it's true that it's, it needs uh, involvement of all the stakeholders in the process of mediation sometimes uh, mediator only involves the conflicting parties which is i mean the company and the community but without involving the government which the actually the the, the cause I mean, the government actually part of the cause of the country itself. So, yeah, it's true that we need to be comprehensive. We we should inform the government and all the because there will be there is still need changes in the policy level to to complement the mediation process. Right. Um, hi. Um, I I think I have two questions uh, for the panel. I think the first one is, I think it's quite clear that uh, for the forestry companies, fires are detrimental uh, to their operations because it harms the fiber, the wood, and, and it's directly linked to your, to your, to your sales of, of your pulp and paper. Uh, what I want to understand, and it's also clear that like the big companies like Golden Agri, Wilma, they have come out to uh, put in place like sustainable uh, palm oil and, and things like that. So what I want to understand is, like, for the smaller palm companies, is it really is it in their interest to, to participate in, in burning? Uh, and, and I'm wondering, is that happening on the ground? Uh, so that's the first question for the smaller palm companies. Like, are there are there rogue palm companies out there? Uh, the second is, um, like, we're hearing a lot today that what's really needed is multi-stakeholder uh, engagements to solve this problem, um, but. Question to a panel then is like what's what what is stopping uh, what's the gap or what's the game changer that can help all of us solve this problem? Uh, would you like would you like to answer this question? I think if uh, the question is game changing from the plenary, you can hear one is the one map. The clarity of maps in Indonesia is really, really vital for us to improve it. That first. The second one, if you want to do that, then you have to work on the ground. Not just from behind the table, but on the ground. Because we can see, if you look at why a smaller community are clearing or burning the, uh, the breeze, because they have no tools to do that. So that's why we can help them, for example, by combining all the companies in the Rio province to provide tools to clear the debris and then introducing how to use uh, composting and so on and so forth. They will not work. I'm very sure about that. Thank you. Bye. I'm just uh, adding what Papa Petrus mentioned is that I think uh, what we need is uh, a comprehensive framework for managing this fire. I think so far there is no uh, com comprehensive framework for managing this fire. Comprehensive here means we should have a, a measurement not only at the local, at all levels, at local, sub-national, to national, even in international level, how international community can also help uh, address these issues and also not just at the yeah so we need a uh, more comprehensive and also collective action is I think is needed so at the moment I think people still do address fire by their own without collaborating and also yeah how to work together I think it is also important okay, well unfortunately we need to wrap up very soon but we should go for one one more question My name is Andy Rovi. I work for the British government here in Jakarta as a forestry advisor. It's great, great presentations. Thank you very much. Very clear. I might have to ask Petrus a question because now he's gone over to the other side. Last Monday, I, I heard APP announce their one million hectare conservation uh, program, multi-stakeholder approach. They said, "I said, where's April? Where's April? They were not in the room." You know? <laughs> 
I just wonder if uh, a and are here in the room. And have you guys got together? Have you got plans to get together and sort this out in reality with the government and with the resources of Recoft? And the second pointer, have you looked at the in Papua, the way they resolve conflict there? as a big company working where governance is weak, where government is non-existent. Just some ideas. Ideas always teasing me, huh? <laughs> Andy, thank you for your question. Uh, for, for sure, we not behind APP. Both APP and RAPP or IPRM, we call it, both are working on that. I skipped one slide actually because of getting from the back that the time is up. Actually, I put up the sustainable forest management policies that we just found in the 28th of January this year. So, on that uh, announcement, we even commit ourselves to work one on one. One hectare of plantation, we will work hard to conserve one hectare also. So that is one, one example that we are really concerned. The problem is, when you talk about biodiversity, that is the NCD area, right? And now another pressure from, I don't know from where, is about the carbon content or HCS. So this is also, we are working toward that direction. Which one is the industry standard availability? If the industry standard for HCS is fair, then of course, as uh, stated in our policy, we also mentioned that we will follow that, uh, that industry standard available for the industry to work with. Okay. All right, then, well, thank you very much for turning up in such high numbers. We need to wrap up, unfortunately, we have many more questions, but um, so. Um, um, I'd like to invite you. There's no break, and you need to go now to the to the next uh, to the next sessions. Thank you very much.